Welcome, my name is Tim Giuliani. I have the honor of being president and CEO of the Orlando Economic Partnership. So we're here for a really specific purpose today, and we have somebody that has come in that has 30 years of experience uh, dealing with transit and being a planner and helping cities and regions. He's got a real uh, unique um, and broad perspective on how you use that to help people, how do you improve the quality of life how do you give more time to, in my case, it would be helping coach my kids' little league team or going to my kids' soccer games. Um, you can't do that when you're sitting in traffic, right? So how do you enrich people's quality of life um, through transportation? And so on your uh, seats, we kind of began, began our journey as an OEP in this, in this area with a report that said this isn't about transportation, right? It's just a way to advance a much more important goal. So we have an Alliance for Regional Transportation. I think that all of you are getting to know and Jim Hartman um, has helped to initiate this, um, this part of the operation. And over the next several months, we really wanna bring in relevant speakers to really bring to life what we see and what others see as opportunity for this region to, to really take it to the next level. So the idea today is not to tell you things you know. The idea today is to have a broader part of, of the region um, see things through a different lens and to really be challenged as to how we all, um, including ourselves, really look at, at transit and how it, more options can lead to more opportunities. Um, so we, we want to engage you in this conversation. Um, we're going to start today um, with our guest speaker. and. I want to first recognize we have a number of elected officials that have joined us, and I sure hope I get all of them. Um, I know we have uh, Mayor Demings is here from Orange County. We, we have Commissioner Timothy Sullivan from Lake County. Seminal uh, brought the, the half the bandwagon here. We've got Commissioner Constantine, Delari, and Zembauer, for the three of you <laughs> gentlemen. So the part of this process you all dread is, did I miss anybody that is serving our community in an elected role? Yeah. Pam. Pam. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> Appreciate that, and Pam came with us to Tallahassee to advocate uh, on on issues important to all of us, so thanks, Pam. Okay, so now um, I certainly want to make sure we get to the main event as fast as we can, so to do that, I'm gonna introduce um, the consultant that is putting together our Alliance for Regional Transportation, Jim Hartman. Well, good afternoon. It's great to see you all here um, today and um, bring you this uh, very uh, distinguished uh, uh, speaker for you. Um, for those of you who have seen uh, Jarrett Walker before, um, you know that you'll hear some things that may sound familiar, um, but he's got a particular way of helping us visualize and think about mass transit especially. Um, and today represents our real, our first uh, of the educational series that we hope to put on uh, with the Alliance for Regional Transportation. And that is a group made up of investors in the um, uh, economic partnership and also with many of the agencies and counties and cities. And we'll grow this alliance over time so that we all can learn together um, educate ourselves on how important transportation is, how complicated it is for our region, and then when it comes time to really become advocates for good transportation solutions, we'll all be ready. That sound like a good goal? Does to me. This is so critically important now. So in our region, our seven county region, we are growing by 1,500 people per week. And by 2030, that's a mere 11 years away, we expect to add, and this is a conservative number, 600,000 more cars to our region. So think about your travels today. Think about what that's gonna bring to us 
because we enjoy some really, really good growth here, but we got to prepare for it. In some cases, we have to catch up. In other cases, we got to prepare more. Um, so it's easy to sit back um, and say somebody else is going to take care of this problem, but it's really up to all of us to help those in decision-making positions take care of this problem so we can all do it together. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Jarrett Walker, who is a consultant in the public transit network design and policy. He's been a full-time consultant since 1991 and has led numerous major planning projects in North America, Australia, and New Zealand. And both Tim and I had the pleasure of working with Jarrett when we were up in Raleigh, North Carolina, devising a transit plan, uh, which we took to the voters successfully. <laughs> Um, Jarrett is uh, president of Jarrett Walker & Associations based in Portland, Oregon and a principal consultant with M.R. Cagney in Australia. He is the author of the popular transit blog humantransit.org and the book Human Transit, How Clear Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Our Communities and Our Lives. So let's all welcome Jarrett Walker. Um, thanks very much, and it's great to um, be here. Uh, thanks to all of these great sponsors. And um, to talk with you about freedom in the city. <clears throat> so I want to start with a really wacky question. How many adult elephants would fit in a wine glass? <coughs> this drawing is not to scale. <laughs> I want you to notice the feeling of certainty you have about your answer to that question. And then I want you to think about the question, in 2050, how many adult elephants would fit in a wine glass? And I would want you to discover that uncertain and terrifying as the future may be, there are some things about the future that we are absolutely certain about. And I want you to notice that kind of certainty, that certainty you have about the fact that objects don't fit in containers smaller than themselves. That's called geometric certainty. A philosopher would call it axiomatic certainty. It's a thing that it is basically impossible to doubt. And this is very important because if you follow the media, there's all this excitement about transportation and all, and supposedly everything is changing and everything is new and everyone's scrambling to figure out what experts we should trust. And I'm a little unusual in that I am always saying, don't trust me because I'm an expert, trust me because I'm making sense. <laughs> and if I stop making sense, don't trust me or ask a question or something, right? But don't just assume that because I'm an expert, therefore what I'm saying is true. My goal is to make what I'm saying seem obvious to you, the, to give you the kind of certainty you have about elephants and wine glasses, because a lot of what we know about transportation, this is, a, this is a big secret, a lot of what we know about transportation, we actually know the way we know about elephants and wine glasses. It's actually geometry. And if you can notice that you're in the presence of geometry, and notice when, you're th when we're thinking about an actual geometric idea, you can be incredibly certain, incredibly certain that you're right. So it's about space. And one of the things that I can promise you is that of all, despite all the great inventions that are going to happen, technology is not going to change geometry. Ge technology is not going to change this. Here is how much space 60 people take going down a street if they are on a bus. Here is how much space they take if they are all in private cars. So 60 people in private cars fill the street and there is no room for more people in cars. But there is room for more people. Now, now let's look at all of our exciting inventions. Now once everyone gets into Uber and Lyft, it looks like this. <laughs> Except it's a little worse, because what Uber and Lyft have done is remove parking demand by adding traffic. 
That's because an Uber and Lyft car doesn't park the way you park your own car at your destination, but it does drive from one job to the next, and that driving from one job to the next is new vehicle trips. More traffic, less parking. Not necessarily a winning trade-off in the long run. Then, of course, someday perhaps we'll have driverless cars and now it will look like this. <laughs> now, the driverless car people are going to come at me at this point and they're going to say, no, 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 the cars will be closer together, see, so there'll be more space, and okay. So, so yes, maybe the cars will be a little closer together, but really only on the freeway where a whole bunch of cars are going the same direction at the same time. On a city street, cars are turning constantly, joining and joining. There's not going to be much room for that space there. And in any case, something much worse happens at this point, and you all know about it if you've ever widened a freeway thinking that that would fix traffic. It's a problem called induced demand. And induced demand is a fancy word for a basic principle of biology, which is that if something is easier, becomes easier, an organism will do it more. This induced demand is the most basic principle of biology. I defy you to doubt it. If you stop and think about what an organism is, an organism is something that needs resources out of its environment. It is something that is going to get resources out of its environment. And it has to run, every organism has to run a positive balance sheet. It has to get more energy out of those resources than it spends getting those resources. And so every organism is programmed to do things the easy way rather than the hard way. And so if something becomes easier, like driving becomes easier, we will do it more. I live in Portland, Oregon. Like everybody in Portland, Oregon, I love the woods around the city and I wish I had a cabin in the woods. I don't have a cabin in the woods because it, it would be miserable to spend to drive there 40 miles and drive 40 miles back. And, but if I could just sit in the car and work while I was driving to the cabin in the woods, I might actually buy the cabin in the woods. And so would all the rest of Portland. And we would chop down the woods and just have cabins. <laughs> and that's induced demand. So this is serious stuff, induced demand, and don't, don't let someone tell you it's just an economic idea or that it's some sort of, sort of wonky thing. If you stop and think about what an organism is, you know what induced demand is. It's biology. Which is why, if we have driverless vehicles, we're going to have to have a driverless bus. The Chinese are working on it. The Europeans are working on it. And again, if and when driverless technology, level five driverless technology is ready, I don't know when it will be, we're, we're going to need it. Um, so here's the thing about all the technology pitches we're hearing. Marketing wants us to mix everything together and get excited about a vision of the future. But if you actually want to keep your head on straight and make, make sensible investment decisions, you've got to think about how these things are separate. So there are separate problems for, that have separate solutions, and they're remarkably separate still, even despite all this marketing. So there's the problem of communications information when and where they are needed for which the solution is apps and information technology. Great stuff. There's the problem of emissions and the efficient use of energy for which the solution is probably going to be electric vehicles. <clears throat> There's the problem of the efficient use of labor and also a problem of safety for which many people think the solution will be autonomous or driverless vehicles. And finally, there is the independent and unrelated problem of the efficient use of space in dense cities for which the solution is big vehicles, and big vehicles are fixed route public transit. The only way more people are going to be able to travel down streets that are not going to get wider is, if we, is, if, is one of two ways. They either need to use person-sized vehicles, bicycles or scooters or whatever gets segways or whatever gets invented next in that space, but something that's not much bigger than your body, because there's room for lots of those or they're going to have to share a vehicle. And in order to use space efficiently, they're going to have to share a fairly large vehicle that has room for a lot of them, and that's fixed route transit. And nothing does that. Nothing uses scarce space efficiently the way fixed route transit does, and you know that the way you know about elephants and wine glasses. But why do we plan transit? What are we trying to do? <coughs> One of the problems we have is that lots of people think that transit planning is obscure and difficult and we have to trust experts. And my job is to make it absolutely transparent and simple. And one of the things we have to do is get clear about what we're trying to do. Because there are people who are trying to achieve economic development. 
There are people who are trying to achieve civil rights. There are people who are trying to achieve equity. There are people who are trying to stop climate change. And actually, deep down, a lot of us are probably trying to do all of those things. And deep down under that, then we have to ask, so what do all these things have in common? What's the thing that transit needs to be able to do in order to do all of those things? And the answer, I think, is that transit has to deliver freedom. Do human beings value freedom? Think about that question. And now I'm going to ask, in 2050, will human beings still value freedom? Now, I'm asking you for a prediction about human behavior. This is slightly less certain than the prediction about elephants and wine glasses. It's not geometry anymore, but it is biology. Because we're all animals, and animals all have to get out into the world. They have to go places and do things. It is intrinsic to our nature as the kind of organism we are that we have to go places and do things, and that the freedom to do that is fundamental. So when you talk about transportation, I'm talking about freedom. Transportation planning is freedom planning because where you can go is what you can do. Where you can go is what choices you have in your life, and transportation planning is deciding what choices you will have, what options you will have. We are deciding how free people will be when we decide what transportation options to create. So this is biology too. By the way, this is also history, legend, and literature, and one of the reasons why you should all hire literature students like myself, I have a PhD in literature, um, is that they will have an instinctive sense about when you are having a conversation that human beings have been having from the dawn of time, or when you're dealing with an issue that's been a universal issue in human history, as long as there have been humans, and that is a really helpful way to understand when you're in the presence of something permanent, something you can count on, like this controversy will always be there. So Abraham Lincoln, those who would not defend the freedom of others deserve it not for themselves. We know from the story of the founding of this country that freedom is not something we secure by ourselves, even though we enjoy it by ourselves. It is something we only secure by working together. And when we don't do that, we don't really have freedom. So here is a picture of Lincoln's idea. What is happening in this picture is that people are experiencing the denial of freedom. They cannot get places, and therefore they cannot do things. And the reason they are experiencing that denial of freedom is that they are denying that freedom to others in the same moment. You are not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. And we are all in that, that is always the reality of traffic, right? So this is a picture of Lincoln's idea. This is a picture of a freedom failure in which, by virtue of the fact that we are seeking our freedom in a way that obstructs the freedom of others, none of us are ultimately experiencing very much freedom. I am not blaming anyone, by the way, for driving a car. I expect people to make a reasonably logical choice in the context of their alternatives, and in this region right now, most people driving cars are doing the logical thing. I think that's important. It's why I'm not worried about changing culture, because in my experience, you don't need to change culture, you just change people's options. And when people have good options, enough people will choose other options that things will start to work. That's been my experience, rather than trying to change culture. So we can draw pictures of freedom. <clears throat> We're doing a project in Dublin, Ireland right now. It's about the redesign of the bus system. And I produced this tool where I can put down a hypothetical person at any location. Her name is Jane. I can put her down anywhere in the city. And I can draw a picture of her freedom. That's where she could be in 45 minutes on public transit plus walking, that blob. I want you to always to visualize that blob. The fancy word for them is isochrones. But they are images of where you could go in an acceptable amount of time, which means they are images of what you can do. I like to think of this as a drawing of the wall around your life. Because outside that wall, if this wall is, say, a 45-minute travel time, then outside that wall are jobs you probably can't hold, and schools you probably can't go to, and quite possibly people you're not going to meet. Maybe you're, you know, quite possibly the person you're going to marry is only going to be, is, well, that is only going to happen if that person happens to be in that blob where you're going to be to encounter them in the course of daily life. There is only so much of this that you can do on the internet. <laughs> so <laughs> we can then show people how a particular plan changes their freedom before, 
after. So we're doing a network plan right now in Dublin which changes people's freedom in this way. This particular person experiences this growth of freedom. I can quantify that. She can get to 43% more jobs. She can get to 43% more shopping and a lot of other stuff. She's 43% more free is fundamentally the claim that we're making because her li in her life she has 43% more meaningful choices whether it's the choice of where to shop, the choice of what career to pursue, the choice of where to go to school, the choice of how to socialize, the choice of how to worship, all those choices depend fundamentally on your ability to get there in a reasonable amount of time, and that is what we are planning when we plan transportation. So we need to be open in talking about this outcome. This is very powerful, by the way, when you're proposing a particular piece of infrastructure, because the politics around a piece of infrastructure, like a piece of rail line or bus line or whatever, are always whose district is it in, what street is it going down, who benefits from its immediate presence, but if it's well designed, it has a secondary impact in terms of how it connects with the bus system, how a lot of other people get where they're going as a result, and this captures that, right? This shows how those benefits spread out beyond just where the line itself is. Really helps with the politics. So, again, notice that the way I get from a network and the pattern that the city is built in to the freedom outcome is a purely geometric calculation. I don't need any social science. I don't need any psychology. I don't need any, um, I don't need any marketing studies because I'm not predicting what people will do. I'm just showing what they can do. And I'm suggesting that independent of our desperate need to predict what everyone will do, it actually matters just what people can do. And that particularly when we're trying to think about the benefit of across the entire city, when we're trying to think about what we're ultimately delivering for prosperity or civil rights or equality or climate change, we're, we're, we need to be thinking about delivering freedom. So when we predict ridership, by the way, and this is also what happens when we predict traffic, there are actually two steps in the, in the black boxes that do this. First of all, they do a calculation of something very much like freedom. And then they add a whole bunch of social science, which about how people seem to behave and how people seem to respond to certain choices, which is great stuff, and I admire people who work in the social sciences, but it is infinitely less certain than that first step. Infinitely less certain that, than that first step, which is just the calculation of what people can do. And so I want to always take this apart into two steps because that first step is interesting by itself because the idea that people can do things is also valuable, is also a thing we should, we should claim for what we're achieving. Um, and inside of those social science assumptions, you know, what happens when, what's going on when we predict human behavior in 20 years? What's going on when you open a study and it tells you what the traffic volume will be on a road in 2045? The only way anyone can claim to say that is to assume that the way people make choices today is the way people will make choices in 2045. This is logically equivalent to saying, young people, that when you're the same age that your parents are now, you'll behave exactly the way they do. Right? Logically, we have to assume that everyone is a carbon copy of their parents because we're using your parents' behavior you know, if, you, if your parent, whatever age your parents are now, we're using their behavior today to predict how you will behave when you're their age. Groups of young people, this just goes right down their spines. They don't want to hear this. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> they're right. Because they're not going to be copies of their parents. Because progress and change ha and, uh, happen through, through kids being different from their parents in all kinds of ways. And that's a great thing. And with all the change coming at us that we're going to have to deal with as a society, it's a good thing. So I don't want to tell people how they will behave 25 years from now. I think it's great that I don't know. What I want instead is to know that they will have lots of choices. So maybe freedom matters more than prediction. And maybe even those of us who are investors know ultimately that we're desperate for predictions because we have to make decisions based on them. We also know that fundamentally the work of investment is the work of being at peace with risk. That's what it is. And that lies fundamentally in the fact that none of us really has a prediction of the future. And when people ask me for a prediction of the future, I will often say, you know, you shouldn't really care about this, but if you want me to make something up, here's something. Because ultimately, I don't think it's what it's about. <clears throat> So how with transit do we maximize freedom? What are we actually doing when we try to design a high freedom network? Well, as I said, it's just math. And there's some math to it. 
But it's pretty simple math, and the way it works out is it's high all day frequency, and I'm going to talk about frequency more. Forming a connected network with reasonable speed and reliability following certain land use patterns, density, walkability, and linearity, and I'll talk about those for a moment. But first we have to talk about frequency, because frequency, the elapsed time between consecutive trip, um, buses or trains along a route, is the thing whose importance you are underestimating. However important you think it is, it is more important than that. Let's talk about why. Frequency is a cubed value because it does three separate independent good things. It means less time spent where you don't want to be. In other words, waiting. It means easier connections to reach more destinations quickly. It is, frequency, it is through frequency that lines that cross on the map actually connect. You can actually get off one and get on the other because they are coming soon. And it's important that they be coming soon for that to be possible. So if you have a low frequency network, you have a pile of unrelated lines, like a plate of spaghetti. Whereas when you have high frequency, you have a network of lines that work together so that people can quickly turn, essentially, at every intersection and go whatever direction they need to go by getting off this vehicle and getting on that one. And finally, better recovery from disruption. Bus breaks down, another will be along soon. That's why frequency is really the thing that drives a lot of the outcome of that freedom map, much more important even than vehicle speed. But frequency is hard to explain to a motorist. Because if you are yourself a motorist, if you get around by car, you don't have the daily experience of you cannot go until something happens. The closest experience you have to this is probably the cycling of traffic signals, where indeed you are stopped for a little while, but you're stopped for two minutes. It's nothing like living on an hourly bus route, right, where nothing happens until that bus goes. So sometimes I will say, imagine there's a gate at the end of your driveway that only opens once an hour. <laughs> so if that were your situation, you'd care a little less about how fast you can drive on the road, and you'd care more about how to get this gate open to open more often, and bingo. That's transit frequency, and that's why frequency is often more important than vehicle speed. That's why when we're having all these conversations out there about high-speed rail, and I want to say, well, what, what, what are we doing with medium speed rail and low speed rail where the train actually comes frequently so that you're not waiting a long time just to go fast? Ultimately, that's often not a good trade off. Frequency, <coughs> and particularly frequent buses, are also critical to your affordability challenge because if you decide to do it, it's not too hard if you decide to put the money at it, to have a sufficiently abundant bus network that you can have a lot of routes where service is coming very frequently, like every 10 minutes or better, where the next bus is always coming soon. Again, when the service is that frequent, that also means wherever those lines cross, it's easy to transfer to go whichever way you're going, and that's how we get that big blob of freedom for people. The beautiful thing about frequent buses is that unlike rail, it's not going to drive up housing price, uh, land prices everywhere it touches, and as a result, you can build more affordably. One of the most critical things we do along a frequent network is build apartments with less parking. In fact, in the city I live in, Portland, Oregon, you can build apartments with zero parking if you're on the frequent network. And this is critical to making apartments affordable because as any developer will tell you, it is the parking that makes high density so difficult to pencil out. So this is a crucial tool. Just freak, we have a sign on our frequent network. It says frequent service. It's associated with high density. Here is a street in inner city Portland. When I was a kid, this was all one story. Now it's all four stories. It's all redeveloped. Um, we're about two miles out of downtown. It's obviously a high value neighborhood for a bunch of other reasons. But all of that density is built around a high frequency bus line. Not a streetcar. There's no rail there. There's never going to be rail there. It's just, a, but there is really good transit service. And so that's what happens, especially when you have no parking requirements, especially when you let this stuff be built with little or no parking, because the people who are going to live there are obviously choosing a relatively transit-oriented low-car lifestyle by virtue of choosing to live there. We're not telling everyone to live there. We're not you know, forcing people into cities. To my conservative friends, I just have to say the reason we're building this stuff is that if, the, if people didn't want this stuff, it wouldn't be so fantastically expensive, right? The incredible high cost of dense inner city living is the market screaming at us to build more of it. 
If San Francisco were such a terrible place, it wouldn't be so expensive to live there, right? So that's fundamentally what we're trying to do. We're trying to create the ability to respond to a market which is screaming at us to make high density urban life more affordable. And the frequent bus turns out to be an absolutely critical tool as part of that. And if you get all the incentives right, you get this. <clears throat> part of that too is that the frequent network has to be advertised. So many cities have some sort of published visible thing, the frequent transit network, rail and bus or whatever that technology is, that shows exactly where you can go without ever waiting very long. And then of course you want that map to go up on the wall, not just in the transit agency, but also in the land use planning department and in the traffic department, because you want everyone to be looking at the same map and understanding that on those particular streets, transit really has to get through. And also on those particular streets, Various certain kinds of uses should be locating, the social service officers should all be on those streets, and so on. You want that map up in the real estate office, you want to see ads for apartments that say on frequent bus. You want all that convergence so that the frequent network comes to be lined with people who appreciate it. Which, without coercing anyone, is the way it goes. So the, you know, the way you achieve this is simply by informing the market and let people make their own choices about whether they want to rely on transit or not. The short, this is important math, the shorter the trip you're making, the higher the frequency you need. <clears throat> Think about it, you would wait a day for a flight to London, but you won't wait a day for a flight to Atlanta. The distance you're going is going to determine how long you're willing to wait. So this is a challenge with SunRail, which um, as a tourist yesterday, I rode SunRail from Orlando to Winter Park, and it was fine because I was a tourist, and as a tourist, I have lots of spare time. This is the peril of transit tourism. Do not go to a European city, have a nice time as a tourist, and decide that that's a good guide to how things will work at home. Because as a tourist, you have a different sense of time than when you're at home, and that's a very common mistake. So I didn't have a problem waiting half an hour to go to Winter Park. But you and your average lives, Orlando to, Orlando to Winter Park is not that far. Half an hour is not a reasonable amount of time to wait to go that far. And of course, in the middle of the day, you could wait 60, 90 minutes. The SunRail line is too short to be as infrequent as it is. If it were going 50 miles out of the city in one direction, with an average trip distance on it of 20, 30, 40 miles, people would be more willing to wait that long time between trains. But your line isn't that long, and Orlando's in the middle, which means the average trip length is not that long, which means you're really going to have to have higher frequency if this thing's going to work. I know you have a big challenge in front of you. The state is handing over the, the operating responsibility to the locals. You're going to have to fund that, but you're also going to have to look at opportunities to reduce the number of employees for vehicles so that you can afford to run more trains so that the thing can actually really function. If you had service every 15 minutes along the SunRail alignment in some form, whether it's light rail or whatever it is, you'd have something really transformative. <clears throat> this is also a challenge with downtown shuttles. Orlando's made a big investment in limo, but if you all get around on limo, you've probably noticed this, which is that 10 minutes is a long time to wait to go half a mile, right? 10 minutes is, not, is, no, is a very nice wait if you're going from Orlando to Winter Park, if you're, but if you're going just like half a mile, you kind of start walking. And so this is why, this is why a lot of downtown shuttles are, are, are a little disappointing and why, I'm, why we need to be cautious about them and why if you're going to do them, again, you have to really invest in frequency. You have to see the next one coming. Um, so please remember, if the frequency doesn't make sense, the line doesn't make sense. And if you hear a proposal for, the transit, for a transit service of any kind, you must immediately ask how frequent it will be and do not let them say, oh, we will figure that out later because frequency is not a detail. Frequency is existential. Frequency is a question of does the service exist when you need it? So it's fundamental and it's something I have to pound the table about again because my motorist friends don't have the same kind of personal experience of it. So now I have to have an even tougher conversation, which is that the hardest thing about transit is that I can't make transit equally good for everyone. Not because of who you are, but because of where you are. Your transit is not a fact about who you are demographically, but it is a fact about where you are, and it, and it cannot help but being because of the way the thing works geometrically. Three variables I want you to remember. Density, walkability, and linearity. 
Transit up provides freedom to more people more inexpensively and more efficiently when it is allowed to focus on places that have these things. Which means in the long run, people who want to rely on transit need to locate in places where these things are present. And that's particularly important if you're making decisions on behalf of other people, such as, for example, you're an employer who's making decisions on behalf of your employees about what their commute will be. <laughs> or if you're a social service office, for example, making decisions about how your customer, what your customers will have to do. Now, I want you to notice again, this is just geometry. We know about this the way we know about elephants and wine glasses. So in these two images, these are two images of a city. And these two images both contain a bus route that has the same cost to operate because it each, it, the bus route has two buses on it in each case. So the operating cost is the same. But in the upper image, there are twice as many people around every stop. That's what density is, people, ver people over area. There are twice as many people around every stop. So of course there are twice as many people who might find the service useful. So of course the ridership is twice as high just starting out. Even before you start thinking about secondary factors, like the fact that people in, in high density are, are, are for other reasons less likely to own cars. Parking is more of a hassle, more things are in walking distance, and so on. Walkability. That circle is the quarter mile radius around a stop. The stop is at the center. And in the top image, every, all those, and the black lines in these images are the places in that circle where you can actually walk to the stop in a quarter mile along the street network. So where you have a connected, gridded street network, you, it's possible to walk from most of the circle to the stop in that amount of time. But where you have a disconnected street network, sound walls, cul-de-sacs, um, you, you can essentially wall off most of the area so that it can't get to the stop. To me, as a transit planner, that's as though there were fewer people there. It's a smaller market. It's, a, it's, it's not as good an investment. It must also be possible to cross the street at every stop. Think about that. If you put two stops on opposite sides of the street and you can't cross the street there, you've provided one-way service. What you've actually done is encourage people to jaywalk in places where it's dangerous, and people do get hit doing that. This is a really fundamental thing about arterial design. One of the reasons to move stops a little further apart is so that you can align them with crosswalks and so that it can be safe to cross at every stop. Linearity, my architect and developer friends know about density and walkability, but I generally have to explain linearity because this is unique to transit. Here are two ways that the same four land uses could be arranged. In the first one, they happen to all be in a straight line, which means that a straight transit line connects all four of them and feels like a reasonable path between any two of them. That is how we built cities until 1945. Then in the lower image, you have the group of office towers on a cul-de-sac next to the freeway. You have Walmart behind a quarter mile of parking. You have a college at the end of a long roadway. You have a residential development in a cul-de-sac. Nothing is on the, main, the direct line, so the bus either has to stop a long way from those places or it has to deviate and go in and turn around and come back out. Deviate, go in, come around and done. Once you've built it that way, there's nothing transit can do. But to me, as a transit planner, that is a worse market, and the top one is a better market. And so if I'm trying to liberate as many people as possible for a fixed budget, I'm going to tend to want to go to places that look like the upper image, not the lower image. It's just geometry. You know this the way you know about elephants and wine glasses. It's not culture. It's not demographics. It's not marketing. It's just how space works and how transit works. <laughs> So because of the way the geometry works, we have to make some hard decisions. And this is one of the hardest things transit agencies have to think about, and I want to make sure you're all aware of it. Out there in the media, there is an entirely false narrative that transit is trying to achieve ridership, and that therefore when ridership goes down, it means that transit is failing. This is not true because I've never encountered a transit agency that, it is, uh, that is unequivocally trying to pursue ridership. Transit agencies are not businesses. They have a balance of business and social service functions. And we have to be honest about the fact that those pull a transit agency in opposite directions. So here's a simple fictional city. The dots are people or jobs, so dots close together is density. And so most of the people in this city live along one of those two straight streets, but there's a scattering of people living everywhere. Suppose I have 18 buses, and you ask me to design a network for this city. I immediately ask, well, what's the goal? 
And if you say ridership, I'm going to draw this. I'm going to put all the buses on the two straight streets where I've got density, walkability, and linearity. I'm going to put all the service there. And because I put all the service there, I have high frequency. The buses are close together. The next bus is always coming soon. And as a result, I'm getting that nonlinear payoff of frequency. I'm getting that nonlinear payoff of density. That's going to be the maximum ridership solution. But Mrs. Jones in the southeast corner of this city doesn't like it. Which is okay if the goal is ridership, because if the goal is ridership, the goal is not to take care of Mrs. Jones. But if the goal is to take care of everyone, then we have a different kind of goal. So if the goal is to make sure that everyone has a little something, then I design a coverage network. Now I have 10 routes instead of two, which means these buses come every hour instead of every 10 minutes. Because the bus is almost never coming when you need it, almost nobody rides it, the, but the few people who do ride it really appreciate it, and they and all their Facebook friends will fill your boardroom if you try to cut it. So, <laughs> so the point is this is reality. And rather than saying there's anything wrong with Mrs. Jones feeling entitled to a bus route, we just have to talk about the mathematical fact, which is that she feels entitled to a relatively empty bus. And that we can describe mathematically why, this is, why the bus she's defending is going to be relatively empty, which means if we choose to run the bus, as many, as many transit agencies do, we have to be explicit about the fact that we are doing this for a non-ridership reason and shouldn't be evaluating the results on the basis of ridership because that is not what we are trying to do. So it works like this. When we pursue a ridership goal, we are thinking like a business. I've had many wonderful conversations with relatively conservative Republican representatives of low density exurban parts of a region where I've had to explain that if you want to run transit like a business and reduce the subsidy it requires, the key is to cut all the service to your low density constituents. And those have been very interesting conversations and they've come out very different ways, but that is how the math works. <laughs> that we wouldn't go there if ridership were the goal because the density and walkability are simply too low. So if we go there, we're going for a coverage reason. Ridership is what we do, uh, the ridership goal is what it means to think like a business. People who are trying to do dense and walkable development like it because of course for its own reasons it tends to concentrate there. It is how you achieve all the environmental benefits of transit. The environmental and emissions benefits of transit arise entirely from transit being ridden, not from transit existing. And finally, um, and so maximum reduction vehicle trips, competition with cars, you have to have ridership to be doing those things. But the argument for coverage is just as strong. Who could be against access for all? Who could be against leave no one behind? Um, well, leave no one behind means you'll spend a lot getting to the last person who's hardest to get to, but that's, that's what that means. Lifeline access for everyone, who can be against that? And political geography, service to every city, service to every electoral district, whatever the political geography is, tends to mean what's in this for my territory, and that tends to mean a coverage network, which is a low ridership network, which is fine, as long as you're clear that that's what it is. So I tend to be encouraging cities to have clear conversations about where they are on this spectrum and where they want to be. <clears throat> So, you know, I'll talk to a transit agency and I'll say, well, you're about, only about 50% of your service is where it would be if the goal were ridership. I'm not saying this about Orlando, by the way. I haven't done that analysis here. And then I'll say, would you like to move one way or the other? And you can move this slider in one direction, but it'll have an, an, a positive impact and a negative impact. You move it toward ridership, you'll get more ridership, but coverage service will disappear and you will deal with the screaming of those people and those impacts. You move it toward coverage, ridership is going to go down. You expect that too. I just want people to understand the consequences of their choices. I don't want to tell them what to do about this, but it is a real choice. The math presents it to us. Now, I know a lot of you are, a lot of people everywhere are excited about technology. Rail, streetcars, and then whatever is coming with new technology. So let's just, I just want to talk quickly about what it means to talk about, to use technology as a tool rather than as a goal. There are lots of people out there for whom technology is a goal. People who are selling technologies, well, their goal is to sell the technology. So for them, technology is a goal. But for we who are buying technologies, we need to think about the technology as a tool and, make, and stay focused on what we're actually trying to do with it. Is that a bus or a rail car, that image? If you look at it really closely, you may detect, you may detect clues that give you the answer. But the point is that it's not immediately obvious that this is, in fact, a bus, and in, which is to say buses can be as nice as you want them to be. This is a bus in Paris. 
And buses can be as nice as you want them to be. They can feel as much like rail cars as you want them to. There's a slight difference in ride, but, there, but most of the things that people think are differences between trains and buses are not differences between trains and buses. There, there are other differences that happen to, that there are differences in how your community has done buses as opposed to trains. Now, in fact, in your community, you have really nice buses here, by the way. You have a really nice bus fleet at Lynx. And I encourage you all to ride one now and then. They're very pleasant. Uh, I, rode, I rode a couple of them yesterday. But also, the bus can be as nice as you want it to be. And if you, if you, ever, if you take a junket to Europe, you know, don't just go ride the trams around the inner city of a nice place like Strasbourg or Bordeaux. Go ride the buses in the same city. I've had the experience in, in Heidelberg, Germany once, of going out to a bus stop uh, to a stop where there was also uh, rail tracks there and realized and thinking I was waiting for a, st a streetcar but then a bus came instead with the and it was the right bus and it pulled up and and the bus the interior of the bus was exactly like the interior of the streetcar the point was they didn't want me obsessing about whether I was on rails or tires they wanted to deliver whatever technology delivered freedom most effectively and the way we will achieve freedom most effectively is to care less about whether we're on rails or tires and more about just whether we have a network that gets us where we're going in a civilized way. So when we're choosing technologies for maximum freedom, just talking about the rail bus question for a second, you use rail in certain places where that's the freedom enhancing thing. One is where you already have rails, like SunRail. Another is where you need high capacity, rail excels at the ratio of passengers per driver. Uh, and remember, operating cost is mostly labor until, we have, until we're driverless, so ratio of passengers per driver is important. But almost everywhere that transit is viable, the bus is workable. And it can be made attractive to almost everyone. Come back to that almost in a second. That's a bus in Paris. Notice, for example, the bus is completely transparent. You can see right through it and out the other side. That it's very lightly tinted. Paris gets hot and sunny, too. But you can see right through it, there's a sense that the bus wants to slightly disappear into the street, and that when you're on the bus, you're still in the street. You haven't just been removed from the street into a container for transportation. You're still there. You're still part of the street. That's what a bus stop looks like in Paris. If you decide that buses are important, you will, you will create infrastructure that makes them look and feel permanent. These are, in fact, one of, the most, one of the most powerful navigational aids in the Paris landscape. They tell you where they are. They tell you, they tell you where you are in relation to other things, and they are bus stops. Now, some buses will look empty sometimes, and I bet you have had the occasion to, note, to see an empty-looking bus driving around in a neighborhood, and you've wondered if that's wasteful. So I want to encourage you to notice that, it, that a lot of empty space on a bus can actually be very efficient. And the reason for that is that operating cost is overwhelmingly labor. Because over operating cost is overwhelmingly labor, it is not that much cheaper to run a small bus than to run a big bus. In fact, it is much more expensive to have a bus that is too small than to have a bus that is too big. As a result, Go easy on Lynx if you want to yell at them about the fact that they're running an empty looking bus through, their neighbor, through your neighborhood. They are doing the cost effective thing if that bus is full at any time of day because it would be much more expensive to switch the bus out than to keep running it. Common misunderstanding about service. Um, let me end then quickly by really one of the most challenging things that's always going on underneath the surface when we talk about transit. And that's how we think about demographics and how we think about diversity. <laughs> this is tough. Transit thrives on diversity, not specialization. Those of you who are in any kind of business probably have something you do in your company called market segmentation, where consciously or not, you divide the world into your potential customers and not your potential customers. <laughs> And you want to focus your product on your potential customers. And when you get out into the world and start planning transit that way, it doesn't work very well. Let's talk about why. Fundamentally, if we're, the way I get the most frequency to everyone is not to run one bus down this street for tourists and another bus down You think about a big street like International Drive, you've got lots of tourists and you've got lots of employees and the way a vehicle will come soon for all of them is for it to be the same kind of vehicle for both of them and for the tourists and employees to ride together. 
And if you've had the experience as a transit tourist in a big city in Europe, you've had that experience. You have seen the millionaire banker sitting next to the guy who washes dishes in his favorite restaurant, and they are both on the same vehicle because it's just so spectacularly liberating for both of them. That is ultimately what a successful transit system will look like. So we have this problem in a lot of the way transit's talked about. You'll hear this term choice rider. You'll hear this distinction being made that um, there's a guy, we're supposed to imagine a guy out there who has a car and he likes his car, he's got a BMW or a Lexus or something, he likes it, and I'm supposed to make him leave it in the driveway. And then at the other extreme, you, sit, you see the person waiting at a bus stop dressed for a hospitality job or dressed for a factory job or whatever, and you assume that they don't have a car and that they're forced to use transit. And both of those images are misleading. The choice rider is a, the idea of the choice rider and pursuing the choice rider is a great way for relatively fortunate people to say that the system should be designed around us. But there may not be enough fortunate people for, uh, for it to actually be logical to design the system around our tastes. Meanwhile, at the opposite extreme, I'll tell you, when certain transportation planners get together in a room and they think no one else is listening, they don't just call this person a dependent writer. They even, use an even worse word. They call them a captive writer. Captive writers like we have them in the dungeon. And it's not like that either. You can lose most of the writers that you think of as dependent if your service gets bad enough. And likewise, there are enormous numbers of relatively low-income people who are out there forced to own cars because the transit system isn't useful to them. And the logical thing, way to get cars off the road is to go after them first and to build on them as a foundation. What does this mean? This means that when you see Someone at a bus stop direct, dressed for a hospitality job or dressed for a factory job, you know they're relatively low wage. I want you to recognize that person as an early adopter. What is an early adopter? An early adopter is someone who uses a product before it's necessarily good enough that you would use it. But because they're using it, they're giving you something to build on. They're giving you something to grow on. So that person that you see as a low-income low customer is your early adopter, is, if you will, your pioneer of transit and needs to be respected in that role. And we must never take them for granted. We must also recognize that when we can make transit available to lower-income people, it's an excellent way to give them an option that makes them less poor because owning cars is very expensive. And you may have a choice as a low-income family between when, you're, when your kid turns 16, you may have to choose between buying them a car and sending them to college. You want them to have those choices. So it's a spectrum. That's the thing. Most of us are in the middle. Most of us have various incentives and disincentives to driving. Lots of people like me can afford to drive but just don't really like it very much. Partly because I've been in a car accident, and as a result, I'm extremely sensitized to how dangerous driving is. Um, I, the statistics that we all hear about but don't really think about, I actually feel. So I have a different experience of it. Everyone has their own experience of it, which is why it's about giving people choices and not deciding that everyone is in one bin or the other, choice or captive. So transit is hard because we're used to win lose, we're to, used to the win lose dynamic. We're used to the dynamic of competition, and the challenge is that transit is such a win win. We maximize freedom precisely by maximizing everybody's freedom, not by maximizing this person's freedom at the expense of that person's freedom. It's the network that maximizes everybody's freedom that does the best, just as that's what uses space most efficiently, so that there's room for more of us in the street more of us in the city, more of us doing what we want. So for Greater Orlando, I advise you focus on the real choices. How much transit, ridership or coverage. If you're going to grow sun rail, grow frequency. You're going to have to do that. Above all, resist the urge to specialize. Don't let there be this for the tourists and that for the employees going down the same street. Find the service that's, that will be right so that it can be abundant for everyone. That's going to be the key for you. Thanks very much for your time. You want to open up for some questions, Jared? Happy to take a few questions if someone wants to ask. Uh, 
Uh, thank you again for talking. I was just wondering, what has been your experience with uh, public universities supporting, because often many universities have their own transportation ecosystem, and some are engaged in partnerships and others are not. So I'd just love to hear what you see in terms of trends across uh, the country and whether universities have their own planners or how they're actually involved in that process. It's the same challenge of specialization. You know, it's the same question fundamentally. Sometimes a university will start offering its own transit system, maybe because the, the public transit system simply isn't able to offer what they need. But at some point often they will discover, you know, wait a minute, why do we have two buses going down the same street, one for students and the other for everyone else when they're going down the same street at the same time? Most university students have no problem being part of the diversity of society. They're perfectly willing to ride, what, and, and they tend to be very clever about figuring out whatever, what else, whatever is working. There's an interesting example, Savannah, Georgia, a city I'm working in right now. The major university, the Savannah College of Art and Design, has its own bus system. It runs right on top of the city bus system. There's a bus once an hour to the mall in the city bus system. There's a bus once an hour to the mall for the students. There could be a bus every half hour for everyone at the same price. So, so the key to universities then is making the right deal with the transit agency so that university students have access to the transit system. And that ultimately solves so many problems for the university. The university can start really turning down parking at that point. At some point, universities get to the point where they need to build more academic offerings. They want to build them on parking lots. They need to turn down parking. If you're about to build a parking structure, whoa, stop. <laughs> run, the, run the transit options. Figure out what you could do with transit before you build the parking structure. A um, lot of great things going on with universities, up to the extreme of something like University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which basically runs the city's transit system because 90% of the riders are students anyway. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Sir? Sure. Uh, trains or bikes and scooters, do you see that as a fad or a trend that's worth pursuing? There's, the person-sized vehicle is not a fad. It's very sensible that one of the ways we're going to fit more people down streets where we don't have room for cars, transit is one way, the person-sized vehicle is the other. The person-sized vehicle tends to be better for a somewhat shorter trip Partly remember because we don't have a lot of patience for waiting to go a very short distance, so the vehicle that's there is ready to go is going to be better. I'm agnostic about whether it's a bike or a scooter or a Segway or whatever gets invented next, but I encourage you to think about that category of the person-sized vehicle as being very important. There's going to be a lane, need to be a lane that's the right size for that vehicle and that kind of 15 mile an hour speed. Yeah, very important. Details about what, the, what technology turns out to succeed in that space. Anything else? Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. OK, so that was exactly what we were hoping for. Um, <clears throat> You know, so someone to challenge all of our thinking about what transit is, why it's here, what it could be used for, and how you go about thinking um, of, of what to build or what to invest in. So this is part of, this is really kicking off, you know, challenging all of our thinking. I think we all know there are decisions ahead um, of how you, um, you can't build our way out of this with more roads only. And that's very clear to all of us that ever drive in Central Florida. And so we want to keep the economy growing and attracting people here to fill the jobs. And the only way to do that is to make sure that they can get around and have a good quality of life and that it's not lost in sitting in traffic. So a couple things to remind you of. Um, March 20th, um, <clears throat> some of you may know our, the Orlando Chambers taking on some new programming. and so idea to profit. Um, so you might be familiar with business, the business model canvas. <clears throat> so this is a process helping businesses add, uh, think about new products, new services, how to scale ideas. And so this lunch and learn on the 20th uh, could help you do that. On the 29th, along with um, certainly the uh, lead is Orange County on the Regional Economic Summit. Um, so Mayor Demings is gonna be highlighting local businesses, entrepreneurial programs, and then we're gonna have a panel from a regional perspective talking about 
initiatives, challenges, and what's new of moving the economy forward. We'll also have um, Dr. Sean Snaith give an economic forecast for the year, and that's free, open to the public at the convention center, but it would be a good idea for you to register for the 29th. And then, I think new to many people, we have the barbecue on the boulevard that unfortunately we had prediction of strong storms uh, the night that it was supposed to occur. So we have rescheduled um, the same event by Lake Eola, Central Avenue on May 7th. So you'll be seeing lots of information about that, but you may want to put that into your calendar. So there's a few upcoming opportunities uh, for you to engage. So again, thank you for attending. I'm, I'm sure Jared's going to be around for just a little bit if you're interested in coming up and asking any questions. So thank you for participating.